bit of brain work now, a bit of brain science. Uh, forgive me if you're a cognitive neuroscientist or a psychologist, I'm a teacher. Um, some of this will skip over the technicalities uh, of this and might be quite simplistic if you're already an expert in some of these, but we're going to see if we can apply some of it. Let's, um, this is Harry Potter and the Curve of Forgetting, which has nothing to do with Harry Potter, it's just a, a trick to try to get you to come along. <laughs> but it's about the Curve of Forgetting. Atkinson and Schifrin developed a model of how the memory works in around right about 1968, where they published in 1968. It's a very simple model, and it's been so well received that it's almost ubiquitous now. Most people know about this. We have a short-term memory and a long-term memory. Most of you will have heard of that. Um, it's slightly more complex than that, but broadly speaking, it's about right. Short-term memory takes in sensations, information, new experiences and holds them there for a very short period of time. It sort of acts like a buffer, almost. And then some of that goes into long-term memory. A lot of what learning is about is how we get things from short-term memory into long-term memory. Because we all know that last-minute cramming for exams sort of works, but it's a waste of time. It goes out of memory very, very quickly. The other aspect of short-term memory, according to the atkinson schifrin memory model, is that it's got very limited space. As new information comes in, old stuff gets pushed out. All this new information I'm giving you now may be pushing out that list of numbers. Might be. Or you might have tried to get it into long-term memory, I don't know, or medium-term memory at least. But we could use that if we can keep things in short-term memory a longer time, the stronger the association becomes with long-term memory, the more likely it will still be there. But how do you do that? Prior to Atkinson Schifrin, prior to the cognitive neuroscience, which actually took apart these things and looked at what was happening in terms of brain chemistry, a guy called Ebenhaus, in 1885, actually studied how we forget, and how quickly we forget. And his Curve of Forgetting, which should be the title of a Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Curve of Forgetting, is about right. It's empirically tested, that is by talking to people, by giving them exercises like trying to remember a list of numbers and seeing how quickly they forget. It's not actually built on proper cognitive neuroscience, which is undoing the brain. It looks like this. Broadly speaking, if we learn new information, immediately we can recall it. It's in that short-term memory. But over 20 minutes or so, around about half of it has gone. After about an hour, something like 60% of it has gone. At the end of the day, two-thirds of it has disappeared, and the next day, well, definitely two-thirds has gone. After a week, You've only retained about a quarter of it. And next month, which is when your exams are, maybe, there's only 21% of it left, typically. <coughs> Note the scale on here, if you're a left brain person and like numbers. You'll notice this is not a linear scale. So the gap between here and here, and here and here, and here and here is actually different. It's actually stretched out a lot more. If we were actually to stretch it out for a proper scale, the graph would go over there. And Screen. What it means is that unless we do something, we're going to forget things. Here's another image of it for people that uh, perhaps learn better through images rather than graphs and numbers. And the key thing is that after 20 minutes, most of the stuff that you've learned is gone. And after two months, 90% has gone. <coughs> But there's a key thing on this slide, which you might not be able to see at the back. It says, without further revision, this is what happens. There's hope. It means we can actually do something about it. If we tune in to this curve of forgetting 
and actually act along the time scale of this. And revision doesn't mean necessarily the traditional revision that students do for exams, revising, going back through to it. Let's have a look at the curve again. This is the forgetting curve. One month, 70% has gone, two months, 90% has gone. But if we tune in to the timings of this, and hit the points where we revise the material, the new learning, we might actually be able to put people onto a learning curve, a curve that goes up through those key points. What it seems to be saying is that given that 20 minutes is a decent amount of time to forget a good portion of it, that within that first 20 minutes, go back to it. Given that an hour is another key point where a lot of stuff will have gone, go back to it in an hour. I'd love to be able to say that it's no coincidence that our lessons as they go through secondary and many of our learning experiences in primary are timed on an hour deliberately because of this. They're not. They're timed for timetabling convenience. But we can use that hour. We can use those one hour revision periods by saying, okay, let's spend 20 minutes doing something, learning something new. At the end of that 20 minutes, just stop. Think about it again. The next 20 minutes, perhaps apply it. The next 20 minutes, review it. The best learning that I see goes on when you go into a classroom and you see teachers using that 20 minute, 20 minute, 20 minute period in that way. Something new, something that activates learning. Stop, think about it, apply it, use it. Another 20 minutes. Stop, recall, recap the whole thing. And then ideally set the homework. It gets students to look at it again that evening. But after that, interleave it so they come back to it later.